All right, hey everybody, for those of you tuning in, this is, my name's Elaine Duff. This is episode 30 of Celebrating the Brand Ambassador. Laura and Nick are working on sharing it to their page. Say hi. Um, Hello. <laughs> I'm really excited today to have Laura Lashley and Nick Crutchfield with me. Um, both my first time actually interviewing people, both now working for Diageo in some way, like both all the brands are in Diageo and they uh, work for an external company, but it's still called Diageo Hospitality Group. Um, and Laura works for uh, Seedlip and Nick is the, I'm actually gonna let everybody introduce yourself, but Nick works <laughs> for the whole portfolio. So, which I totally get, cause I used to have to do that job myself. Uh, it's, it's a fun one. But Laura, I'm going to start with you. Um, so I already introduced you, but you can do it again. Okay. <laughs> what brand do you work for and what are your responsibilities for that brand? Yeah, so um, my name is Laura Lashley. I am currently very newly minted as the on-premise manager for Seedlip at Diageo. Um, so Ooh. I just recently, yeah, so we're, this is a very new um, phase of my role. Previously, while Seedlip was a a freestanding company before we integrated into Diageo, um, I was the national education manager. So still doing a lot of the same things. Um, <clears throat> my journey has been like starting out as a brand ambassador, working through a several different kind of roles, but all at Seedlift. So that's me. Very, very cool. And Nick? Yeah, so uh, I am on my third or fourth iteration of projects with Diageo. <laughs> Currently I'm the master of education for the control states for the Diageo Hospitality Partnership. I have a stellar partner, director, Sarah Tilton in that division, and we uh, we get the job done along with about 150 other people spread across the country. So it's my mission to help spread the knowledge of Diageo, of category, of community across our uh, network. I love that, I love that. I love the idea of spreading the idea of category because that is such a, a great thing to do. And I, Laura, I know Laura, you have that thing as well. Like, you know, the non-alcoholic category is such a emerging category that there's a lot of uh, misconceptions and getting people to understand it, you know, at a deeper level, um, I think is so important. Um, I'm gonna say, so we're gonna start with a couple of things. Um, you both worked in hospitality for many years before becoming brand ambassadors. Um, so. You know, this is a big thing that people ask me, you know, who want to become brand ambassadors. You know, what do you think some of the moves that you might have made in your own careers while working in hospitality got you noticed by brands? Because not everybody is like sought after and, and you guys were both sought after. So Laura, I'll start with you. Sure. Um, you know, I got kind of as I as my career behind the bar progressed, I started managing cocktail programs um and you know i think I, I was very interested in eventually becoming a brand ambassador because i felt like i had you know skill sets and and interests that would align with that eventually um so i did myself seek out opportunities and apply for roles um ultimately with with the seedlip job it ended up being a former coworker that i had worked behind the bar with who connected me to people who were looking for people to represent Seedlip. So it was, it ended up being just a really like a case of someone who'd worked with me behind the bar and knew kind of my work ethic and my skill set mm -hmm. and my interests and was like, hey, I think, I think this all aligns. I think this person is right for the role. So I think, and it, it was a bar job I'd had, you know, seven years before. So it's like one of those things that you never know mm -hmm. where or when someone you're behind the bar with in the trenches with on a Friday night might turn around and give you like your next big career opportunity. No, and you must have made quite an impact. And that's a big thing, you know, like trying to emphasize that with people within the industry, especially the young ones coming up, you know, everybody's, you're always being watched. People are judging you all the time. And if you get known as the party person, you're not the top of the list. You're not like the first person to think, oh, I should definitely hire that person. So I'm not saying you can't fuck up once in a while. And like, you know, you have like a night where you might've got naked on the bar once, you know, maybe, well, maybe not that, maybe that's a little too far. <laughs> um, but you know, we've all, you know, we've all gotten a little, you know, out there, but yeah, if that's, as long as that's not your personality and 99% 9, 9 of the time, I think that you're known as a responsible person you're the person people seek after. 
And and Nick, how about for you? Um, what were you doing well, before? How did Brent? So <laughs> I, I've done a lot of things in the restaurant and bar industry and hospitality yes, industry. Started <laughs> off as a barista at seventeen. Uh, went into a nightclub, ended up working in the busiest nightclub in Tidewater, it's a section of Virginia, uh, at the ripe age of 22. First shift ever was a Friday night at the busiest bar in town, and I didn't even know how to open a Guinness. I will not talk about the rest of that experience. It was a weird interaction, but it was amazing because it taught me immediately humility very, very quickly. And that's a huge, huge thing to have in this industry. Um, then it progressed into running concert venues across uh, the Mid-Atlantic to designing bars and bar systems um, to developing teams and coaching those teams to be the best versions of themselves so that we emulate that through the community. Um, and then uh, later on, I had a, a gentleman visit my bar who owns a, another company that I started uh, education with. Uh, he just moved into Sperryville, which is a small town outside of Charlottesville. He's from Orange County, California. And he asked me if I like tequila. And I was like, of course I like tequila. <laughs> he goes, well, I noticed you have my, my brand on your shelf. And I was like, oh, God. And then we started talking. And that kind of spiraled into going up to D.C. and training people, which spiraled into opening some bars in D.C., which spiraled into uh, you and giving me a call um, as I was wrapping up the build out on our our first bar with that group. And who is and you? Asked, Explain who you and Morgan. So Ewan is one of my mentors, uh, one of the main figures in my life for uh, pulling me into this. He's been a great guide, almost like a spirit guide, if you will, <laughs> um, pun intended. Um, he's been a great mentor and a great guide through this process. And he asked me if I wanted a lifestyle change. Um, Ewan is... I don't know how to explain him. He is such a a collection of information and personalities wrapped up into a Scottish ball. And he's <laughs> vibrant and lively and extremely smart and well-spoken and genuine. Mm -hmm. And he helped, helped guide me through the process of becoming a brand ambassador into an educator from a bartender. And a lot of people think that that's a natural progression and it's not exactly a natural progression. There's a lot of stuff you have to learn along the way and you have to be open to learn it. And um, so it, it progressed into doing uh, well, these different back projects. Second. I, I love yeah. the question. We talked about this a lot yesterday because yeah. asked you if you wanted a lifestyle change because it is a big yeah. change. So, yeah. you know, what was your life like and why, why was the lifestyle change so appealing? Well, life was good. I was, um, <laughs> uh, I was opening bars, doing my consulting through Cast Proof Consulting, and um, really enjoying what I was doing. However, I was coming home at four thirty or five every single morning, and my spouse, my partner, uh, she'd done thirteen years of that. And when he said, "Do you want a lifestyle change?" And that means essentially become a day walker. Uh, my industry friends will completely understand that. Um, I said, well, let me think about it. And we explored it and talked about it. And it's one of the top decisions I've made in my life. It's I get up at seven every day without an alarm clock, regardless of what time I go to bed. I am energized to help my team do what they do. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a very different lifestyle. You have to be admin um curious you have to be yeah, admin curious that's a good thing you have to be uh very disciplined in your time in your sleep and your energy and your workout you have to find balance and you have to stick to that regimen so that you are prepared for everyone in your life from work and from personal life you need to be able to show up for everyone yeah, no, which is not easy. I mean, Laura, I know that's it. No, it's just some great points. It really is. And it is a huge lifestyle change from working late. And then now suddenly you have to have, you know, you have to be, you still have to work late a lot of times, but you have to get up really early in the morning and you have to be fresh as a daisy and ready to roll because you might be giving a presentation to some very important people that day. Um, Laura, what if, about you, for you, what appealed to you about the role? Like when they came, when you finally decided to take the job? 
Yeah, I, you know, I was in a similar, well, I, I had already kind of made some decisions. I was at a crossroads, I guess. I'd been, uh, you know, running bars in New York for like 12 years. And I, my husband and I had decided we were going to move to Los Angeles and I'd quit my job without a plan. I was going to just like move to the West Coast and figure it out. <laughs> and I, I didn't really know what that looked like. I figured I'd probably end up behind a bar at some point, but I hadn't really mapped out like what I was going to do next. I just knew I needed a change. So Seedlip was like a very fortuitous moment. It, it came to me at the right time because I was in a place where I was really open to something unexpected and new. I mean, I had never heard of a non-alcoholic spirit. You know, I was a bartender, so I, I you know, wasn't necessarily seeking out something non-alcoholic, but all these kind of different factors combined. Um, I, I tasted the product and I met with the people involved in the company at the time. And I was like, this is so exciting and interesting. And I was just in a place because I was, you know, open and had kind of thrown my life up in the air that I was like, let's do it. Let's, let's try this. <laughs> and, you know, I can totally attest to the, I'm, I'm a night person. It's, it's not even just because I, I always joked that I became a bartender, so I would never have to have an alarm clock. Like I just, <laughs> did. I've always loved, I, I feel like my brain works better at night and, I still struggle with that at times. Like there are times when I'm sitting all day in front of my computer, staring at a PowerPoint I need to make or staring at an Excel spreadsheet I need to do something with. And then after dinner at like nine o'clock at night, my brain clicks on and I can like work on it. So I still, you know, I, I have to still negotiate my own hours to work for me because, um, you know, that's just sometimes my brain just wants to work after midnight or whatever. Um, and that, but, it, like, but that's okay. I mean, like I, I took a full, like, you know, as many people did so a lot of online courses this year and I took a full productivity course, you know, a very expensive one, you know, and I, it was like three months long, like every Saturday, like taking this. And it was, it was uh, by a gentleman who wrote the compound effect, um, which is a great mm -hmm. book. Um, and, you know, most people are morning people, but there are definitely people who are at night. And for you, if that's your time frame, I mean, that's when, for me, I have to do all my important work between seven and 10, like that seven and 10 in the morning, like <laughs> not, not in the evening, like I am not a nighttime person. So my most important projects, whatever it is, I will get up, I get up every day at 630 and I meditate and I do my routine. And then from seven to 10, like sometimes I don't even shower until 10, I just work. And, you know, and I sit in my office and whatever's the most important project I work on for you, it sounds like, and, and as Nick was, and I just said, like, it might be for you, it's after those hours, unless you have events going on. It's like, why not do your most important work at, like, do all the trivial things. I do all the trivial things for me in the afternoon. For you, the most important project could be at nighttime. Like, that's when your thinking cap comes on. Um, yeah. Nothing it's wrong with that. It's an interesting, my company too, uh, for a long time, a lot of the decision makers and people were in London. So like negotiating those time zones and figuring out when you can get the people you need to answer to something you need, you know, like all of that becomes, I think, really important. You, you learn, you definitely learn. Admin Curious is like a hilarious way to <laughs> Admin Curious. I, I thought I knew how to do admin because I was like used to doing inventory and running bars and doing a certain amount of emails, but this is like a different, you know, a different beast entirely. And it's something that was a huge learning curve for me just to prioritize those things. Yeah. Because you, you know, you always want, you gotta get to the account and see if the menu's up. You gotta go to the training. The, the stuff that you have to physically do in person always sort of feels like it takes precedence, but then you have all these people in a company that are waiting on admin that's really important for them to get their jobs done. So. I, you know, that was a big learning curve for me and I had to, I had to prioritize and manage my time to get that stuff done for sure. I'm, sure, I'm assuming, uh, Nick, you have, the, you have the same <laughs> struggles sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. I mean, I, if I look at my expense hopper right now, I'm 100% sure there's probably 20 or 30 charges in there that I need to, to classify and submit <laughs> um, at some point today. Um, there's, there's a gentleman, uh, that came into my life in about 2013, 2014. Um, and I look at him like an uncle and he, he looked at me one day, we were in Baltimore, I'll never forget this. He goes, Nick, you, you know you have to be your biggest cheerleader, right? Talking about recaps. And I was like, uh, can you expand on that? He's like, well, I mean, if you don't tell it, nobody else is gonna know you did it. And I was like, oh, oh. Ding. Yeah. It's like, yeah. 
okay. And then it, it, that really made me think about admin a little differently. And, and it's, it's us providing our home office the tools that they need in order to get their reporting done so that the agency is seen in a positive manner and getting those things turned in on time. And for those of us that are in the industry, you know that on time is 15 minutes early uh, and <laughs> on time is late and late is fill in the blank. Yeah. So getting our admin done and getting it in on time so that our um, coworkers, our peers at home office can, can, construct us in a positive manner is extremely important for the continued uh, relationship of what we do. Now, I think those are both of you guys have made some great points and it is important for them. Um, I will say, and this is something I think I said to you yesterday, Lauren, it, but I also, I have a philosophy. Everybody's email that gets sent to me is their own agenda, not mine. So by answering it, I am just helping their agenda. And if my agenda is more important or my boss's agenda is more important, they're going to wait. They're going to just wait. And then I'm going to do the things that I know are priorities. I know it's not always easy. Sometimes everyone else says urgent. And, um, but also, uh, Lacey Hawkins said this to me. She works uh, for Monkey 47. And I thought this was great because, again, you, I, I, that gentleman so correct. If you don't toot your own horn, Nobody else is going to do it. And I had a frustrating moment. I remember working, you know, for Diageo, an agency, and I had taken somebody else's job, right? So mm -hmm. I was doing two jobs at once because somebody left the company and I was doing their job as well as mine. And it was before I was a brand ambassador. And, but nobody knew it. Like nobody noticed, like nobody noticed that this person left, but the role just kept going. And I just thought, oh, when bonus fam came around, I was very young and naive at that time. I'm just gonna get a massive bonus. No, nobody even recognized it. Like nobody even knew. And I realized at that point, so I said, you need to let people know. You need to send email out. And Lacey does something really neat. Yes, recaps are important, but she found out all the senior executives, anybody like the marketing people from the other side of the company. And whenever she has a big win, she sends out an email to all the people. She's like, hey, Monkey 47 had a great day today. So it's not about her. Yeah. That way, because it's hard to brag about yourself, right? Because then you feel like you're bragging. Yeah. So it's always about, and this is how it's, so it's about the brand. Us, the brand, exactly. we had a big win today. And she sees, sees, she writes a little like news thing, puts a little picture in there and sends it to everybody. So everybody knows who Lacey is. Everybody knows what she's doing in the marketplace because senior executives a lot of times don't know you know, yeah. what's happening. And, and they probably, some of them do want to know, they want to be in touch with what's going on and they're never going to read the recap. So if it's just like a little blurb, like, hey, we had a big win. Um, and I was like, that is very smart. And I and it's something I, I would definitely recommend. Um, I, I think that's so true. I, I It feels weird in the beginning to do it. It feels like bragging or something. And I think a lot of us feel like, ooh, we don't want to, we don't want to shout out our, you know, our wins or our activity in that way. But like whatever the platform is at Seedlip in the beginning, we used Slack. And, you know, when you when you go out and you see a great menu and you share the you, you kind of forget as a brand ambassador that not everybody else from the company is out in the field seeing what you yeah. see. It's kind of like you have to be their eyes to say, like, this is what it looks like out here. And it's exciting for them to see the brand come to life at an event or see the brand on a menu or in a beautiful cocktail. So I think that if you can, kind of, like you said, take yourself out of it and think of it as the brand, like. This yeah. is me showing you what all of our hard work has like netted us. And then, by the way, you also get to like show what you're up to. And yeah, of course. You know? It's a win-win and, and they all know yeah. it. They all know what you're saying. Like, hey, I did this thing, but it's okay. It makes you feel better. Like you're putting it out there. But yeah, as, as you're right, because, you know, as somebody work, like some people aren't out in the industry. Like they go to work, they, you know, and they're behind their desk, they do their, their jobs. And then they go home, they get back on a train and they're out. So they don't know how the brand is and you are the eyes and ears. Uh, in the streets, which is really important. It's also really important. That's why social media is an important thing for you to build your personal brand because, you know, putting things out, you know, I used to hate doing it. I used to not talk to anybody. And I did a lot of cool shit in my early days. Like I was on a lot of TV shows and whatever. I didn't really talk about it because I was afraid of the backlash from the industry, you know, that people would be like, who she thinks she is, blah, blah, blah. Now everybody fucking does it all the time. <laughs> Yeah. It was a hard lesson to learn. I was like, I, I give this, I always say this when I do, I do a seminar on personal brand, how to build your personal brand, because it is when you're building your career, you are building yourself as a, 
as a person and as people get to know you. And I was like, fuck the industry. Fuck what they think. Because there's always going to be somebody there who hates you. They're going to be jealous of you, whatever. Just put it out there in the world. And as long as it's good intention and it's nice stuff, you're not bragging. You're just saying, hey, I, I, got, to, I got to do this cool thing. Isn't that I awesome? think that's, that's also how you were going back to your question about how brands found us or how people noticed us. Yeah. I look back on my career behind the bar and I was really focused on just like getting through service and just doing my job, which is great. Like you have to be that. Um, but I think also, you know, if you want to work for a brand or you, you want to be a brand ambassador, you can enter in competitions and making yeah. yourself known and seeking out opportunities to, you know, be quoted in press and make a cocktail that's featured somewhere like that kind of like seeking yeah. out those visibility opportunities is OK. And I kind of felt like, oh, that, that's just like showboating and I'm just going to do my job behind the bar. But I think if I had. Um, you know, taken the opportunity to promote myself a little bit more, I probably would have, you know, found my way to where I wanted to be even faster. So I would definitely like, don't wait for the brand to just like pluck you out of, you know, the bar you're in with your head down, like making service tickets. You got it. You got to yeah. get out there and let people know, you know, what you're about to. So no, I think that's a big thing. Yeah. Nick, go ahead. You're going to say something. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with both of you on this wholeheartedly. And I think that you have to make a plan. Like if this is what you want to do, go get some spreadsheet classes, go understand how Excel works, go on whatever reporting app you want to use and, and just go through it and, and get comfortable with it and learn how to network. And Elaine, you and I talked about this yesterday. Toastmasters was a godsend for me. Like being able to go to a class where I get immediate feedback on public speaking um, and in learning how to speak eloquently because all of us think we have the gift of gab behind the bar until we don't have that three feet thick piece of wood in front of us anymore. Once that's gone, it's like, oh, the training wheels are off. Yeah. Go learn how to speak confidently in front of people and don't forget about the people around you. Every single chance you get, uplift them. When you give, you will get noticed. No, I think that's uh, such great words of advice. And, you, and it takes us into the, my question I was going to ask you, because nobody comes to this job fully equipped. You know, mm -hmm. you don't just transition from bartender to brand ambassador, even from one brand ambassador job into another brand ambassador job, because every company is different. Every, every system is different. And you're constantly growing on the job. Um, mm -hmm. So, Nick, let's talk about that. So what were some of the challenges you first had coming out the job? And you can spend more about Toastmaster. <laughs> Yeah. So first, the, the gift of gab, thinking uh, thinking I could speak to anyone and everyone. I, I did a lot of sports in high school, a lot of art, um, a whole lot of art. But one of the things I was really interested in was oratory contests. I really loved public speaking in, in high school and through college. Like I did Model GA, Model UN, and so forth and so on. And reintroducing myself to that and reintroducing myself to critical feedback and, and understanding how to get rid of the filler words, the the clutch phrases, so forth and so on, just like that one I just said, <laughs> is imperative to be able to stand confidently in front of others and speak without just relying on brand talk. Is what you went, what you all were talking about before when you remove the eye from the, the brand and just make it about the brand, that's integral into the success of what you do because you're talking about a category so that people understand the category with the brand in that category and you're going to be tied to those two things so you have to do it in a positive manner and always mm -hmm. speak good about everything around you so being able to pluck yourself your capital s self out of that presentation but still keep it relatable to people i think is imperative to the success of how you um present in public not only present but present yourself and the brands no, I think that's a really great, great point because it, it, it is it is practice that it you is. need to have. And I, I actually, since you said that, I'm like, I've been thinking about taking Toastmasters and I'm like, I think I'm going to take that. And, I, and I've been speaking in public for a long time, but I know there is always something to improve. And I know I put in those still words and I watch these afterwards, you know, just to pull out clips. And I'm like, oh, that was painful. I can't believe I said that or I can't believe I. I said that word so many times. Um, so that is great, you know, and Toastmaster sell because you can now take it online, right? You could do it. There's usually yeah. one in every city, a few of them. There's sometimes dozens, if not hundreds in some cities. 
Um, they don't do the manual anymore. You can do it online uh, once the world gets back to normalcy, whatever that is. Going forward, there'll, there'll be some in-house in club activity going on as it was prior to the pandemic. Um, but what I love about it is it not only teaches you oratory practice, but it also teaches you leadership and it gives you the opportunity to to do some officer type functions within the club. So whether that's a timekeeper, an odd counter, or a PR person, uh, it's VP of PR. Uh, that's the one that I held here in DC prior to moving away from DC. Um, it gives you good practice and applicable items through what we do in our career. You know, there's there's a there's a line from a song, TV on the radio is the band. And it's one of my favorite lines is my repetition, my repetition is this, my repetition, my repetition is this. And that's what we do. It's the repetition, the practice of presenting. I think that's, yeah, it, it, it really, it, it does take practice, you know, over and over into different types of audiences. Because every single audience, you have to change what, how you're presenting from the consumer to the distributor to the, to the trade. Um, it's really important. And, and for you, Laura, what were some of the challenges when you switched from bartender to, you know, what were the skill sets that you kind of were like, whoa, I need to learn a little bit more of that? And Yeah, I, this is a really silly one, but I, it's something I know other friends of mine who've transitioned into brand ambassador roles have also had. So I didn't have the right clothes, <laughs> which sounds so silly, but like I had, you know, I, I had a uniform behind, at my last bar job before becoming a brand ambassador. So I had, you know, clothes I would wear to weddings and then I had like clothes I'd wear on the mm -hmm. weekends. And so I just didn't have this like clothes. And I'm not talking about like not every brand ambassador runs around in like a blazer necessarily, but I just didn't have like that middle ground of clothes that I still felt like myself in and still felt kind of stylish in that were presentable to like go to a GSM and talk to a group of distributors. In. That's so, important. It's, it sounds silly, but like, you know, and I'm not saying you should like build up your wardrobe in anticipation or anything like that, but it just, it was something I had to like stop and make an active choice to like buy some things that I could go to and say, okay, this is, this I can always wear to a GSM. And this is like what I'll wear if I'm doing an Instagram live, cause it's from here up. And so that was one like silly kind of like. No, that's important. It's really important. Yeah. Believe me, I've had, I've had brand ambassadors. I've been consultant for a company and uh, one of their team members, and I got a call because the brand ambassador went to the GSM and they were just not well dressed. They just, you know, it wasn't like they expected to be in the suit, but they were in leggings and a normal, like a t-shirt. And the, the client called me and she's like, uh, did anybody tell her what to wear? And I was like, no, because I just thought everybody would know since it's a business meeting and that was a mistake. I was like, not everybody knows like what you're yeah. there to a general sales meeting. Yeah, um, and it also, I think, you know, if you, not that we all have to walk around in our brand colors or all, all the time or anything, but like, if you're representing a luxury spirits portfolio, you got to look the part a little bit and, you know, mm -hmm. in the way that still feels genuine and feels like you. So I think like taking the time to figure that out is, is part of the job. Um, and then we one other built, I'll stop you. It's like we okay. actually in the beginning when I was building budgets back in the day, we actually used to build that into the budget that you could expense five hundred dollars uh, a month on some clothing. Just so people could build up their wardrobe. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's the dream. Those were the days. <laughs> those, those were the days. And I'll be honest with you, I have fought because I have literally had to do. You know, they would send me to the Oscars and the Emmys, and I was like, I don't yeah. have the wardrobe, and I'm not spending my own money, $1,500 on a really expensive dress to do whatever, to go to this place. And Rent a Runway didn't exist at that moment <laughs> yeah. in time. But even if it did, I was like, I need to be able to expense some of this. You know, I've had a fight. I've had some big fights with the brand team saying, I don't mind going, and but I need a budget. You need to leave. I'm not saying I have to get a $1,500, but I need like a $500 dress. I need to look like I belong. And yeah. I don't yeah. have that currently in my wardrobe. And I don't think it's fair that I have to spend the money <laughs> to buy that. And thankfully, most people always said yes. Everybody was like, yeah, yeah. sometimes, yeah, I agree. Sorry, we'll get off the, we'll get off the clothes, but yeah. <laughs> no, I think- You should um, always ask. Yes, that's what I was gonna say, is like, if you, you don't have to be the most stylish person on the planet, but if you aren't sure if it's the right thing, just ask, you know, ask a friend, ask your mom, ask someone in the company, is this like, does this look 
like I'm representing the brand well? Does this look like what I, I'm going to fit in in the environment I'm walking into in some way? So I think that's important. The other no, thing that's a little you less. It. You'd be amazed yeah. how many times they say Maybe yeah. we can expect it. <laughs> actually, so I actually also think the other yeah. thing that I, and it's not necessarily a skill set, but something I really struggled to kind of get my head around. And we talked about this yesterday, Elaine, but um, I was really used to having a really hard beginning and end of my day. Like mm -hmm. you set up the bar, you work the yeah. shift, you get a lot of immediate gratification from like making the tickets and giving them, you know, making a drink for someone and seeing them enjoy it you know, job well done, and then you close down the bar at the end of the night. And so, and you know, when you're in management, maybe that changes a little bit, but you still really have this, like these hours of your job that feel very complete when you're over. And um, with, with brand ambassador work, the job just doesn't have those it's beginning pleasant. and ends. And it it's sometimes the wins take a really long time. And so you don't get that like immediate satisfaction, or it's hard to know if you're like working hard or doing a good job. Um, and so I, that transition and learning how to like, you know, learning how to manage my own time, when to shut off and when to say like, okay, I'm done for the day or also learning when to like, the reporting helps with this actually. And the admin helps you to kind of recap even things that are in process. You thought you were going to get a menu, but it didn't happen yet. You, you know, putting some of that behind the scenes work on paper helps mm -hmm. you feel like you've, you know, like you're working and you've, you're still working towards goals, even if they don't happen exactly when you thought they would. No, that's a big, I've heard that a lot. And I remember that fear. I'm like, I'm gonna argue about it. Like, you know, you just, I'm like, am I working hard enough? Am I, am I doing yeah. enough? Cause you're always working, but like they can't see half the stuff that you're doing. Yeah. Um, so there is, it is important to have a beginning and end of day, like having a system that you put into place. Yeah, routine is everything once you cross the continental divide into this world, cause it's, it's very different. And again, you have to be disciplined with it. Like I keep notebooks. Um, I had it right next to me. I don't know what I did with it. Um, oh, look, the computer's sitting on it. So I've got two different notebooks. One is for like ideas, education, team meetings, so forth and so on. The other one is for uh, activation ideas, wins, um, things I need to talk about with my line manager, things I need to talk about with my team. I know they sound very same, but they're very, very different in my head. So I keep them in two different notebooks. Um, routine is, as Laura was saying, you, you kind of have to structure this thing or it, it, your life in it become this amalgamation of one. And it's hard to find your capital S self from your job. And that's a very fine line to walk. And I've learned from some of the best of us that I get up in the morning, I do my yoga or my ride, whichever day it is, or I go swim my mile, whatever day it is during the week. I come home and I meditate and stretch. And then I take my shower, have my coffee, my oatmeal, and then I start my day. And that is every single day. And at around the same time, I'm not going to say it's the same time every night, but if it's a content creation week, seven o'clock my computer closes unless my brain is in full gear because somewhere around six or seven is when my brain turns on in the evening i'm doing like the admin stuff and conceptual stuff during the day but then the work comes at like six or seven sometimes but i have to, i literally shut my computer i go like this at the top of it like <laughs> no more and i walk away from the office and i shut the office door and i don't go back in until the next morning no, and that's, that's you know on some days now when i'm traveling it's kind of the same thing. Wake up in the hotel room, go to the gym, or if I have a yoga mat, I'll do the yoga in the room, uh, eat a healthy breakfast, and then I go out in the market with the team for the day. And sometimes that's 9 a.m. for breakfast and coffee and talking about the day until 11 or 12 at night and rinse and repeat. And sometimes it's a full day of activation. So it's really dependent on what's going on, but you still have to draw boundaries even in the field. You also have to realize that when you're in the field, those people have lives too, and they have families as well. Mm -hmm. And just because I'm there doesn't mean I get to take them away from that. Yeah, because we need balance. I think that that that's a that big one. I mean, the one thing I've definitely have learned to do is uh, so I plan my week. So like Sunday is my planning day, um, and God, if I don't get to do this, it really screws my whole week. So I will look at all my projects that I have going on, and as an entrepreneur, I have lots of different brands of people I'm working with and then I also have my own personal stuff that I'm doing and then I break it down like you know what are the steps I'm going to take this week 
and then I schedule them into my week. It's like, okay. Yeah. Um, so I schedule it. It's like, I know I'm doing this on, on Wednesday. So, and I know I already have my interviews or my preliminary interviews. Already, so I schedule everything else around that. It's like, okay, I have this. But then I schedule my gym. I know what day is I'm going to the gym when I'm taking my class. And that's how I usually end my day. It's like, okay, so my uh, gym class is at 6.30. So it's like I stop working at 6 so I can head down to the to the gym. Um, or else I have something going on. Like tonight I'm bartending. So I actually, I don't. Uh, I bartend one night a week. Uh, something I, I added into my routine because I wanted to do something fun and different this summer. That's um, awesome. It's outside on a boat. It's fantastic. It's oh cool. man, are you at the boat? The the one with the the, the bay uh, Yeah, God, I love that place. It's so God, much I love that place. It's so yeah. much fun. So I bartend there just once a week, and I love it. It's just this fun thing I just decided to do for myself. I was like, I get to be at a bar. I'm outside all day, you know, undercover. I'm working with great people, and I'm making drinks, and I'm making people happy. It just brings me joy. Um, awesome. but I have to schedule around. So Sunday planning is really big for me. It's like looking at my projects and I break all my projects. Something I learned working for Anheuser Bush was to create project plan. So whatever project I'm working on, I will create a timeline for it, whether it's a couple of months going forward. And it's like, mm -hmm. what am I going to achieve this month? And then I break it into small pieces. So even if I have no time the entire day, if I just have an hour, if I just, I'm like, all right. And in that hour, all I have, I'm going to make that one slide. That's all I'm going to do. But at least I did something towards that project. So that That's way, a really I good idea. That dopamine, that dopamine hit of like, I did something today. Like I made a step forward. Um, it could just be, I'm going to make this call, call today. It's like this one call. It's really important. It's going to help me get there. So it's, it's a lot of work up front to break it down into these small pieces and to do it. But I'm telling you, it will change your life because every day you will achieve one little step towards your goal rather than going, I'm going to do that all on Wednesday and fucking Wednesday comes and goes. And all you did was answer freaking emails and you did nothing towards any of your goals. It's been, it changed my life. Um, so I, yeah, anyway, I can send you my, I have a whole thing that I do. <laughs> it's, it's really game changer for me. All right. So enough. I love it. And, and productivity, because um, I think you guys are both very successful individuals who are probably very, very productive, and nobody probably gives you credit for as much productivity as you probably do. Um, but Lauren, I did want to go into you experience that you did when you came onto the brand, it was a small brand. It was by itself, right? So what was it like working for it then and now working? I know it's only been a little, a short time going into Diageo, but your role changed when you changed. But like, there's advantages and disadvantages, right? You got to do a lot when it was in one place. It was yeah, small. I I think you know, I, the word brand ambassador gets thrown around a lot. I think a lot of of companies use it for various <laughs> different kinds Good of point, Trina. jobs. Um, and yeah, I love that. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that when I started with Seedlip, um, you know, it was just, I was the first full-time person in the U S there were a couple of other part-time BAs, but the brand was like, no one had heard of a non-alcoholic spirit. No one had heard of Seedlip. I had like a backpack and a couple of bottles. Um, and we didn't have an office here. We didn't have, I went, there was no payroll yet. Like it was very, very, <laughs> wow. <laughs> really good um, the ground and, wow. Yeah. Well, we, you yeah. know, that stuff came very quickly, but it, but when I started, it really was like, okay. You know, I, I think I told you, Elaine, I woke up the first morning after getting the job and was like, what do I do today? Like <laughs> there wasn't anyone to tell me, you know, and I think as the company grew, um, it was really exciting because I got to see so many parts of the business that I think if I had jumped into working at a large company, I wouldn't, you know, I got to work, I got to see what our digital media team was doing. And I know now all the stuff about Instagram ads and top funnels and bottom funnels. And I got to just really like touch a lot of channels in the business. Um, and I, that was such a valuable set of information. And mm -hmm. I also was able to, you know, the, part of the whole reason I wanted to work on Seedlip was because it was this brand new really innovative kind of crazy idea and getting to, you know, introduce that to people for the first time was really rewarding. Getting to say like, Hey, I've got something you've never tried before. You probably never even thought of this before. Let's taste it. Let's talk about it. Um, so on the ground, that was really exciting. And then like moving into, as we got bigger and then also now with Diageo, I think the most exciting thing there is just the resource and the structure, like structure 
is great because you have people that can help support all of these different aspects of the business. You know, Diageo has whole teams of people that work on like things that probably were just a, a thought in the head of like one marketing person in our team before. So it's really exciting to see how many people can dedicate their, you know, skill sets to helping push the brand to the next level. So, you know, but then, and then you just don't have as much visibility. I think that's like the thing that I have to kind of let go of is like, I used to know everything, everyone who had tasted Seedlip, everyone who was touching the brand, like I knew about it. And it's like, you get very um, protective of the brand when you work on it, when it's really small. And then as you scale up, you just, you have to, you have to trust and let go a little bit. So I think not having that visibility is something that changes with a company, but it's exciting to see all the kind of like power behind it. I mean, yeah, no, I think those are great points. I mean, Nick, you've been there for a while. Any, any uh, advice to uh, <laughs> how to get around or get over that or things, make it work for you? Things, things will always change and evolve and trust in the ideation that it's in the best intentions possible. And nine times out of 10, it's a home run. I mean, we've got some think tanks on some of the the best and brightest groups of people, whether it be our blending teams or our distilling teams or the copper, you know, the Abercrombie Copper uh, team in, in Scotland or your team at North America. We've got the the best and brightest across the globe that are dedicated to making sure that the heritage of each of the brands lives on. It, it's not about acquiring something as delicious as seed lip is and it is truly delicious i was one it was one of the first things that caught my eye uh the year that it came out and i i grew straight to it immediately and we're we're preserving the heritage of each of the brands whether it's talisker don julio or crown royal or name one of our brands it it's not about taking the brand over it's about preservation of the heritage of that brand and making sure that we we continue that going forward. Yeah, totally. I think, I, yeah, go ahead, Lori. Oh, no, I, that's, I think, yeah, I think that's uh, one of the things that I, if you're looking at a brand ambassador job and you're looking at a, you know, a tiny, small brand versus a big brand, I think getting to be involved in the early days of something and watch it grow is like a hugely satisfying part of the job of being a brand ambassador but that's not to say that being a part of a really well reputed established uh and well respected you know team doesn't have you know that same that same feeling so i think there's not like there you know and there are pain points i'm sure like with 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 big corporate situations and startups the pain points are just different they're just different problems you know but i i will say like i think for me, I'm really glad that I worked on a, a brand that was very small just because I got to see all of these different um, aspects of the business, like so up close and personal. So, yeah. yeah, I think no, it's great work because it is when you get to work at a small company, you, you, you know, the disadvantage is that you have to do everything, but the advantage <laughs> is you have to do everything because you, you do, you know, like you were wearing many hats, but you get to learn so many new skill sets. And you get put into so many different positions that you would never have the opportunity to do once you're in a large corporation. Um, so I do recommend sometimes to people, I'm like, if you want a dipper toe or at least understand the industry on a deeper level, go work for a small brand for a while. And, yeah. you know, that you really love and are passionate about and you like the people because you'll probably end up being the social media person, the market manager, the, you know, the brand ambassador, the sales rep, you know. Yeah. <laughs> You'll do everything, you know, and you won't know how to do any of it at first, but you'll figure Mm -hmm. it out. And that will give you skill sets to go and apply for other jobs and confidence. You're like, well, I did that job. And now it's just navigating how the big company works. So I do think it's a nice kind of place to be because you will learn a lot more. Um, But I get the frustration when I went to, you know, for me, and one advice I give you is, and and Nick, I'd love to hear your thoughts about this is, when I work with Diageo, and even when I work with any brands now, I invite them out. So I invite the brand team out with me, or I invite the marketing people or the digital people. Like, hey, you know, I bring them to an account that 
I look like a rock star and everybody loves me so they can see, you know, what value I'm bringing to the brand. Because you always want to look good. You want to bring them someplace that they, they, they love you because you want them to see you in your best life. Right, so they're like, "Oh, fuck!" I'm so glad we brought Laura and Nick on because, like, <laughs> damn, people love them, right? Just giving away all our secrets. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So you know this, right? So you're going by, but then like bringing them there, but like then you get to like ask them questions, like, "Hey, so what are we working on? Like, what's the the project going? So you know, would you like me? I don't mind sitting in a meeting." You know, I would love to sit in your next brand planning meeting to you know just hear what you guys are doing. I love it because I think it's really important, especially a big corporation where you do get separated from them. Kind of, you're going to have to like force yourself in be like, Hey, I would like to be in that meeting. Can you tell me when your grand planning meetings are like, even if it's just me sitting in the room, I will, I can say nothing and I can just be a fly on the wall, but I would love to just learn because this is interesting to me. And I think most people would say yes um to that request be like sure we'd love to have you in there because it is it, you don't i used to have every sit in all the meetings when ciroc first got launched and then as the brand kept evolving um it became interesting and, and the most saddest moment i had is when like three weeks before i left the company and the brand team came over to me it was like the fourth version of the brand team and they like tasted me on some stuff and i was like i'm not sure what that is but let's not talk about it anymore because I, I was like you know it was like some iteration that they were trying i was like yeah no no i was like, <laughs> I, was like I was i'm like i'm there like oh crap i'm like yeah i'm just gonna tell you right now no just whatever you're thinking just don't do that and i'm like this is my last week here so let's I'm just tell me you're not and they're like not gonna do it i'm like all right i can go now <laughs> i don't know they probably lied but it was like you do get you get so attached to your brand you love them yeah you do yeah, get involved with them. You love them, um, but that's my only regret. Is like just ask and say, "Hey, can I get? Can I sit in some meetings? Can I hear what's going on? I love just being involved because it makes me a better brand ambassador." And I'm just curious about how that part of the business works. Um, it definitely helped me uh, a lot, and I wish I actually did it more. Um, all right, so let's move on. Let's talk about um, you. Both came from Barf, right? You both ran programs, right? You dealt with sales reps. You probably dealt with some brand ambassadors. Um, couple times. Couple times, right? <laughs> what, would, what would be your advice to A, we'll do it both ways. We're going to start off like, what's your advice for a bar operator to get the most out of a brand ambassador? Because I've had this conversation, like, I don't know what to do with the brand ambassador. And then, the, and then we'll go the opposite way. What's the best way for a brand ambassador to work best with a bar operator? So let's start with the I'm a bar operator. Brand ambassador comes into my job. It's somebody like yourself, right? You know what the fuck you're doing. And you're like, all right, how do I work? How do I get the most out of you? So our relationship is a win-win. Uh, Nick, I'll start with you. Okay. So I'm going to have the same, I think it's going to be the same answer for both. Okay. Don't quote me on that just yet, but I think it's going to be the same answer for both. <laughs> and you've already said the word partnership. Mm -hmm. It's learning as a bar operator that the brand ambassador, the educator, the advisor, the whatever title we've given at this point in this iteration has a budget, knowing that it's not endless, that they they usually have anywhere from 20 to 60 accounts that they are working with, and that has to be configured accordingly. Um, so being a partner that there's a return of investment on both sides. So the brand ambassador's time is valuable. The advisor's time, the educator's time is valuable. The bar operator's time from the other side is priceless. Yeah. If you haven't done that work before, you have no idea how many hats a operator wears. You're a plumber, an electrician, a dishwasher, a bartender, Laura knows exactly what I'm talking about. You might be a GC or a project manager as well. So there's there's a lot of stuff going on inside of there. And is is an ambassador going into an operator uh, operator's facility? You're one of probably 12 to 15 touch points that that operator has in a week's time. So be respective of the time. Show up early. Do what you need to do. Have a plan. Leave. Follow up on your promises. 
Yes. Follow yeah. up, follow up, follow up. When you think you followed up, follow up again. From the operator side, know that we're coming in and you're one of 60. Everyone is different. You are just as important as your neighbor down the street, as your neighbor across the city. And that the, the budget is there for us to help you, help your clients, help you build regulars, help you improve your systems through education, help your staff understand the categories and the brands better so that you don't have locked capital on your shelves. Everything that's not selling is a missed opportunity to generate revenue so that your staff is paid and so that your lights stay on. So getting us in there to help educate, getting us in there to help facilitate is monumental to both sides' success. And I don't care if that's a dive bar or a cocktail lounge or a concert venue. It's the same formula across the entire board. Now, I think that's a good point. So what if I'm an operator? And mm -hmm. maybe this is the point I can actually say to the person who asked me to ask this question. Uh, if I'm an operator, and I, I know all my spirits, I, I know, and I, I generally take the time to educate my staff. You know, is it a more saying like, hey, your time is valuable. Let us handle that for you. It can be. But also understand that one of, one of the reasons I love Diageo, and there's many of them, but one of the reasons I love Diageo and Enthuse Marketing, who's the agency I work with, is that our education is never done. We are constantly learning. I've gotten my general certificate in distilling through uh, this work. I've gotten uh, my CSS through this work, my WSET 3 through this work, my Cicero through this work. And just because you've done that education already doesn't mean that another set of eyes and another set of lungs isn't going to do it justice. When you think you've learned everything, you're done. You have to be curious. One of my favorite Walt Whitman, and you'll hear me quote Whitman a lot, one of my favorite Whitman um, uh, quotes is be curious, not judgmental. And being closed off is being judgmental. Being curious is being open. So be open to allowing others in to expand somebody's knowledge base. It's only gonna make your program stronger. I think it's a great way. And and, and Laura, do you wanna opposite, maybe the opposite question or, or like, you know, what, yeah. what brand ambassador working with the operator? Yeah, I think the, again, I think it goes both ways. I think it applies, but for, from a brand ambassador perspective, I think, uh, make it simple because these people are busy. <laughs> like, so when you go in and you make a meeting, have a clear idea of why you're there. You come with the clearly communicated way that you want to work with this account and do the research. Like, I, you know, I always say, never walk into a meeting without having looked at these people's menu, know what spirits they already sell, know what their cocktail list looks like. Don't go in with something that isn't right for the venue. Like it's, it's, I can't tell you how many times reps or ambassadors came into the place I worked and pitched something that if they had just done like 10 seconds of looking around they would have realized it wasn't the right program or it wasn't the right fit so i think it's like important to understand that there's not like a one size fits all way to work with a buyer and you need to be able to go in and do your homework and look at the account also buyers want different things i think mm -hmm. like it's pretty clear usually within like a conversation with someone oh this guy really wants you know he loves education he wants me to come in and do it do a master class for his staff that's what's that's what's going to move the needle for him this guy over here lo loves POS. Some people just love POS. He wants coasters. <laughs> he will do anything for coasters, whatever it might be. So I think like you just, you have to learn how to read the cues that people are giving you about what really matters to them and what will make a difference in their bar. Just because, you know, your marketing team thought up a program doesn't mean that on the ground level, it's going to make a difference in this guy's bar or it works for him today. So I think you just really... You have to just, you know, be and be clear, like, I, you know, don't pitch 10 ideas at the same time. Go to somebody with one simple executable thing mm -hmm. and then build the relationship from there. You know, you, you might get so excited. You see an account, you're like, oh, we could do this on Sundays and I, I could do a takeover and then we could have the, you know, you might get, get really excited. But you got to start small with like one actionable, executable thing. And then once you've built a relationship with the buyer, it's a lot easier to make those bigger ideas come away. I, I think that's great. Two two great points. You know, every buyer is different, and you do need to adjust your pitch based on the the, the buyer. But 
having one idea, and sometimes you might go in there with one idea, and then you realize that idea. So it's always nice to have a backup idea. But if that first <laughs> yeah. idea is working, just keep keep going with it, you know, and and yep. then like solidify it, get it done, right? I, I think as a and on the flip side, like as a buyer for years, you get so used to having reps and ambassadors come in and talk at you about what they want to do or what they can do. If you if you as a brand ambassador ask questions to the buyer and really listen to what they're saying, that will give you all the clues that you need about how to work with them. So if, if you ask, you know, so what, what's your top selling cocktail? How does it work here? What do you guys need? What can I, you know, get them to tell yeah. you what they actually want instead of just coming in with pitches <laughs> because yeah. you can spot that as a buyer. You can spot that from a mile away. You're like, oh God, yeah. here we go again. <laughs> yeah, two ears, one mouth. Yeah. <laughs> there's a there's another toolbox item. Active listening. Yes. Active listening. Yes. A absolutely. Huge, huge tool to develop. A ask a lot of questions and then sit that yep. back and just wait for the response and then you have to absorb that information. No, it's really, really great mm -hmm. words of advice. Um, all right. So um Let's move it. All right. So what are some things? All right. So now dealing with the buyer, I guess we already answered this. Like what's some key learnings you discovered uh, successful selling in? I think we've kind of covered that. You know, we're talking about active listening and coming in with clear ideas and what you want to accomplish. Um, so it also means, all right. So uh, this is something, uh, Laura, we talked about yesterday. And Nick, I'm sure you have an opinion about this, is that working as a brand ambassador means you do have to deal with a lot of stakeholders, right? There's a lot yeah. of people interested in your you know what your position is and what they actually think your role is and how they're supposed to be working with you so you have like the distributor the sales reps the marketing team your direct boss you know the digital marketing team you know whatever it may be event people so a um i guess is is there a way like if you're the manager to be able to put a clear message out to all the stakeholders like is there something you recommend like to brands maybe it's not your own brands maybe they do it so well you don't need to but if there's a brand like watching this and saying hey you know if you have a small team you have brand ambassadors here's the message you should be saying to all the other stakeholders who might want to work with your with your ambassador like what how to guide them like what their job is and then also, how do you handle that as a brand ambassador? All the stress of all these different people constantly asking for your time. Um, let's start with the first part. Like if you could give advice to a brand, like or the person in charge of you, um, or the, a brand, we'll say a brand, make it neutral. Not anybody in charge of you, but just a <laughs> neutral thing to a brand who might be out there in the world, who's hired a bunch of brand ambassadors to give to their stakeholders. Nick, you want to start? Yeah, um, it's a hard one. I've never yeah, there's, to well, there's a couple of things here, right? So a brand ambassador's job, if I were to summarize it into a nutshell, um, it is our job to take the brand architecture, the, the marketing speak, all the factoids, the knowledge of production, and turn that into a relatable personal story that somebody can envision and feel bring this bring the life bring this the brain to life through the art of storytelling right? right so that's that's what we do now advice to a a brand team on how to disseminate that to everyone i think the brand ambassador first has to be highly adaptable be able to understand the different functions study the functions and adapt your art to each one of those functions because they all operate a little different, but they all have a core, the core movement to them, core engine. So that's point one. Point two, um, the things change, things evolve. We've seen that over the past 16 months, 17 months, whatever month. It's still March 2019, I think, 2020, whatever. I don't even know what year it is at the time. <laughs> um, and being able to take whatever that mission critical thing is and make it relatable on multiple platforms, whether that's in life, over a call, in Zoom, um, whatever that engine is, it's still the same thing. It's just being adaptable to it. 
I think well, that, 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 those are good points. I was going to say, I was going to say, because I think also the, the point I want to and maybe just to make it a little clearer is how do you make sure that the other stakeholders utilize the brand ambassador in the right way? I think that's a better, maybe that's a clearer question. So you have all these stakeholders, yeah. right? You know, because I used to have, and I'll give you an example. I, I would have, you know, some of the agencies, the obviously we work with a lot of agencies and, mm -hmm. you know, I would have an agency call me up and they'd be like, Hey, Elaine, so uh, we're having our holiday party, you know, and uh, we would love you to bartend it. And I, oh, okay. okay. <laughs> and I was like, that's really flattering of you, but no, like, and I don't need to do that. Like, and they would make try to make me feel bad. Like they thought they had that ownership over me that I should come and bartend their holiday party. And I was like, I don't work for you. We work together. We work as an agency together. And, and I get why you would want me to do that. And I, and I don't mind coming in training. So I said, but I would have to like then protect myself. But I would also have my bot, I would have to speak to anybody more senior to me and be like, hey, would you mind just making sure that, you know, X, Y, and Z agencies understand that this is not appropriate, like for them to utilize me in this way, because they seem to think that it's okay. And I now feel bad that I'm not being a team player because I'm not bartending their Christmas party. Because, you know, as a brand new, we, we're people pleasers, right? We yeah. want to do all the things. Mm -hmm. So as a brand or mm -hmm. as a manager is making sure that those stakeholders understand like this is their goal for the year this is what they're supposed to be doing and making sure they understand that so i this is how i envision you using that more i don't know i, I don't know if i'm just making a statement no. <laughs> no i think it's i think it's a good a really good point i'm a yes man so i i easily fall mm -hmm. down that trap of like just wanting to do whatever everyone needs me to do um, and I think like if you're the brand or you're the brand team or whoever's communicating, whoever's designed the brand ambassador program, right? And again, we said this this term gets used a lot just because one brand for on one brand, even within the same company, the brand ambassadors might have different KPIs or key performance indicators or whatever their goals are might be different. So it's like kind of on you to maybe it's a presentation or maybe it's a you know a one pager on like this is what these are the key priorities that my brand ambassador is here to do. These are their job functions that they will be primarily spending their time on. And this is how they're measured. And this is how, if you want to use them for something, you go about communicating that. And I think that's like okay. the missing link. Yeah. And I'm actually working on exactly that piece <laughs> right now, which is really like, this is like a very, this is very top of mind for me because you want, you know, Ambassadors are there to support distributors. They're there to support internal commercial teams mm -hmm. and marketing teams and event and activation people. And you want all those people to understand how to use them, but also how to go about communicating that they need them so that someone is overseeing like the time management of where that person is going. So yeah. I think it's like, it's like a really clear, if, if, and distributors are a big one too, right? So if you are introducing a, a brand ambassador to a team of distributors as a resource for them, I think it's totally important to communicate like, hey, this is what this person's goals are. This is what their budget is to be used for. This is the kind of target list of accounts they're working on so that those distributors aren't pulling them in a million directions too, being like, hey, I need you to come do this, you know, thing that is nowhere near on your target list or whatever. So it's just like an over communication, I think, to all the stakeholders about how how you want people to be communicated. And there should be like some sort of filter, like mm -hmm. for the brand ambassador, some sort of manager, some sort of filter that those kind of yeah. stakeholders have to go through, because otherwise you do your like pulled in a million directions all the time. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm sorry I didn't hear the question. Uh, correctly again, active listening. No, 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 Nick. Laura, I, I stated it correctly, so yeah, I, that's why I, I want to clarify it. Laura hit all the touch points, and thankfully, I have a couple of filters built in. So we have forms that are built to fill out prior to um, deployment, so that we understand what we're getting into. Uh, and that form actually has to be approved by two different people, so that it aligns with our goals and the mission critical goals of BHP, Diageo Hospitality Partnership. So we those filters are built in place and it's it's very clear across all, especially in the control states. We've never had anything like this in control states. So for us to be able to operate, we have to be very clear with our messaging on what I do, what our local educators do, what our advisors do, and, and how they can operate. And if, if the answer is a polite no, 
we're still going to find a solution for you and find a way through maybe it's pulling somebody local in to do it that that's an i9 at some point mm -hmm. or or something along those points but we'll, we're solution oriented and, and we are solution makers so we will find a way to get it in some way shape or form as long as it is compliant and compliance yes. is always going to be number one no, absolutely. And I, I think those are great words of advice because also as a brand ambassador is knowing that because you do want to say yes. And it's coming back and saying, I don't think, you know, this is how I, sh I this might not be, I might not be the right person for this, but right. I, I will find out who is a person. If we can find you a, a person, you know, like that can help fulfill this need that you have. But so you're not saying no, you're just saying, I, it, I don't think it's my, what I should be doing this for you, but I will right. find somebody who can be doing that for you. So that way you you can be a people pleaser. You are finding mm -hmm. a solution, but you're also making sure that your time is being utilized correctly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I think that's a, a, we got there in the end. Yes. And, and putting yeah. this together a as a team. <laughs> it's a team, but I think it's really important to anybody like brand, you know, watching, it's like putting those systems in place so that you know, if somebody has specific requests, like what is the process they need to go to to be able to utilize that that particular person, and then what's your filter in between? So it's not like a direct. Right. And the um, person who's the filter, or you know, if you're a brand setting up setting up a new structure, say you don't have this program at all, whether it's an agency or internal, the person who's the filter needs to be the person who also has the same goal <laughs> as the embed. Like yeah. they, they have to be this, on the same side of the same team because that's that's how you know with access to the right budgets, the person who can actually make things happen that that actively support the goals of the ambassador. So like yeah. whatever that reporting structure looks like, I think you just got to make sure that whoever they're answering to is the person who has the most closely aligned goals because that's. No, I think that's a great point. They have to be aligned <laughs> with you because if they have no stake in what you're doing, then they're gonna be like, sure, go ahead. You don't yeah. like what we like. Have a party, party. whatever. <laughs> Bart's on the way. Bart, Bart's on the way at that Christmas party, Lane. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> you don't have a kid at home. It's not a problem. You should be doing that. Or it's you just know. the holidays. It's just the holidays. That's what your <laughs> job is for. You're supposed to bartend the agency's freaking Christmas yeah. party because so they don't have to pay for a bartender. Um, all right. So, all right. So let's get that. So we talked about that. We got the stakeholders. All right. So we're getting down, wrapping it up. So big part of your job, we're going to talk about, this is the last two questions. So we're going to talk about training the distributors. And then we're going to talk about what I always like to talk about, which is what do you wish you knew then that you know now when you first started, but we're going to start with the distributors. So because training distributors is a big part of, you know, uh, your roles, right? So getting them excited about the brand. Um, so, and we've all had to do it differently recently. So we have GSMs, right? And then we had Zoom. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the tactics you use when giving presentations to kind of keep them engaged and get them interested um, in your brand? And then, um, and then what information, so, and then how do you distill down the information? What have you found is the most useful information for sales reps to hear? Because it's a different presentation, right? Than you would give to anybody else. Oh, yeah. um, Laura, do you want to start with that? Sure. Um, I actually really love presenting to distributors. I know not everybody does, but I think that these, you know, these people are such a crucial access point to getting your goals met sometimes that getting them on your side and getting them excited about your brand is, is like really, speaking of mission critical, I would say this is like a huge piece of the puzzle. So I think in person, it's diff a little different than Z than Zoom, yeah. but you know when I when I present to bartenders, I almost never use a PowerPoint. I, I don't think that that platform works well. Um, but with distributors, they love PowerPoints, and I think that having a great deck that isn't just the words you're saying on a slide. Like I can't tell you how many times I've sat through presentations where somebody is just saying the same thing that then everybody is reading on the slide and not actually listening to them. So pictures that illustrate your brand and bring it to life, really beautiful pictures on slides, then with key points that you're going to touch on, but not just every, read every single word. I think that is, you know, making decks is a, or, or helping your brand team make the right deck that you need for the right thing is a, is a great skill and it really works with distributors. And then particularly with Seedlip, I think 
people's mind and really opens up and they get really excited about the brand when they taste it. So whenever possible for distributors, I make cocktails so that they can try the product, especially because I'm non-alcoholic. It doesn't matter if it's a 9 a.m. GSM. Everybody can try it. Everyone can taste it and get excited about it. Um, so I think with Zoom, um, for myself, we talked about this too, <laughs> Sometimes you look across the sea of distributors and they're all just looking a little, they've had maybe 15 other brands present before you and they're yeah. all kind of like glazing over. Sure. If you can just find the one or two people in the sea yeah. of the crowd that are looking at you and nodding along, they, you know, lock in on those people. And it works on Zoom too. You, you scroll through until you find somebody who's got their camera on and is looking at you and then just present to them because, you know, yeah. the wind gets taken out of your sails if you get focused on how everyone's looking at their phones or on Zoom, I had somebody like not on mute ordering their breakfast through the Starbucks drive through while I was presenting. <laughs> so it's like you get, you know, sometimes you get caught on like, and then it really just deflates you and you feel your presentation like slipping away. So look for the people who are, you know, look looking you in your eyes and just get your, you feed off of them and feed your energy off of them. But those are my pieces of advice. No, I think those are all really great words of advice. Nick, for you? Yeah, I am in the same boat as Laura, I absolutely love presenting to, to distributor folk, uh, brokerage partners. I love going to GSNs. I'm a nerd like that. I, I really enjoy it. I like seeing how they absorb information. And uh, if I could give tips, it would be keep the information at the 30,000 foot level. Get in, get in a couple of nerdy points in it, but don't go into azeotropic points and why that's important and how we get past it and all that other stuff. Go into some of the brand architecture, go into some of the production process, high level, go into some of the heritage, but most importantly, how are they going to use it in cocktails or in drinks and what foods go with it? Mm. If you can help them increase, help them help their customers increase their check averages, you're going to build a better rapport with your, your brokerage and distributor partners. Um, be personable with your partners. Uh, three of my very closest friends just happened to also be brokerage people from here in DC. And they've all gone on to do different things, but we've still kept in touch over the past eight years. And you'll you'll build some pretty cool relationships if you allow it to happen. And then I hold a monthly call called Crutches Corner where I get further into the knowledge. And then I'm always open. I, I have office hours that I uh, employ once a month. They can dial into it, and I will answer anything and everything nerdy past that 30,000, like down to the minutia, as small as they want to get on anything related to the categories and the brands. And I, I do that so that they can, if they're curious enough to go further, I'm open to speaking with them about it. No, I think that that's that's a really great idea because some of them are. Some of them are a little bit nerdy yeah. and they do want to go deeper, but. I think it's great advice about, you know, definitely cocktails. If they can taste cocktails that you can put yeah. them in and, um, so they can see them and giving them cocktails they can use in, your, in their accounts that are able to be used in multiple different styles of accounts that are easy for them to execute. And yeah, top line, very, very top line, you know, a little of the story that gets them excited, you know, a little bit of this, you know, the production, but just a very enough that they understand why that and why that matters. Like whatever that yeah. is, like it's age and cherry cast okay why does that matter like you know why i think yeah. it's important make, connecting those dots is mm -hmm. really important because most of them don't have the same education as we do so they're not going to connect the dots they don't know exactly what that means like what are the flavor yeah. profiles are going to come through when you tell them some of that production process i found that to be really important for me it's like oh we do this and this is what that does so that they can explain mm -hmm. it to somebody um i also found and do you guys ever do this like I used to take them out, like host a little like afterwards, like, hey guys, so is anybody, you know, you know, it would be from nine to midnight or when midnight and noon. And there'll be like a lunch afterwards, but I'd be like, hey, I'm gonna go to this account, like blah, 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 you know, that if anybody wants to come, I'm, I'm gonna run a tap, you know, you guys can come and hang out with me yeah. uh, to build those bonds, like just to have that yeah. kind of relate after the presentation so they could really see the, the brand in real life. Um, and, and how it activates and, you know, getting them uh, to taste the cocktails in an account. That, that's also helped me a lot. Um, but I also like your point, Laura. Yeah, big pictures, very little words on the page. Um, <laughs> yeah. You should know your, yeah, they're 
don't read off the page. It's very, very boring. It's something I've only learned even more recently um, that I'm like, yeah, I do that a lot. <laughs> um, more, more, more pictures. Um, and now I have like uh, cards that I use, like, you know, sometimes just to remind myself that they can't see. Um, all right. So let's talk about this. So the last thing we're going to wrap it up with. All right. Mm -hmm. What do you know now that you wish you knew then when you first started? <laughs> or words of advice, like a mistake you've might have made that you don't want anybody else to make. You're like, oh, God, I wish I never did that. But I now learned and I'm never going to do that again, because a lot of people make a lot of mistakes when they first start. <laughs> so we're both dumb. <laughs> There's a lot there. Yeah. Um, Laura, would you like to go first? Sure, I can. I can okay. pick up. Um, I, you know, I think that a couple of things from me. I wish that I'd known. Um, I wish. I wish that I'd known how to get over my um, fear of sales or fear of um, asking like for actual feedback from people in meetings and tastings. And, you know, I've kind of learned that although every brand ambassador job, again, has different kind of objectives, we're all working towards commercial goals at the end of the day. So there mm -hmm. is a sales element here that you kind of got to just embrace. And I think you know, figuring out how to do that in a way that feels authentic to you and respectful to your friends and relationships in the industry um, was something that I, you know, I had to kind of learn on the fly. Um, and I, I wish that I'd known not to waste a lot of time on closed doors. Like I, you get very fixated sometimes on the things you, the, the wins you know you should have or the accounts that you know should carry your product or the place you really want to do a certain type of activation and you kind of, I have found once I kind of stopped focusing so much on the places I thought I should be looking at and looking at where I was getting uh, interest and traction and excitement and getting feedback and putting my energy into those places, I started just getting more momentum overall. So I think like not knocking on closed doors and learning, not taking it personally, I guess that's the other piece of the puzzle with all of this is like, you know, we get very close to our brand. We're very passionate about them. We also know a lot of these people that we're dealing with in the industry personally. So it feels like a very personal job. And I think when you, when you hear a no, or when you, you know, you don't, something doesn't happen the way you wanted it to, it's easy to kind of take that, you know, take that personally. So I think mm -hmm. I, I would have learned or wish I had known how to kind of not let that stuff get to me and to just move on and circle back. Like the people, the, the closed doors are only closed doors for now, but it doesn't do you any good to like stand there and hang out. <laughs> yeah. No, that's great words of advice. No, I think that's really important to know because you're right. Cause sometimes your friend, just because they love you, doesn't mean they love your product or they have the budget for it and you can, you know, and they, and, and they feel bad. So they constantly say, Oh, oh maybe like the next menu, the next menu comes because they don't want to tell you no. And then you're like, you realize you've just been wasting your time because they, so they, they, they love you, so they're not going to say no, but they're also not saying yes. So if they close that down early, it's like, you know what? It's fine. Don't worry about it. We're still friends. I'm just going to move on. Um, I think that's great words of advice. Nick? We've talked about a lot of this, I think, in the past uh, 70 minutes or so. And I think that there's a lot of tools in there that I wish I had known about. Uh, whether it be acronyms or, or regimens or um, anything, that, literally anything we've spoken about, but I, I think if I have to boil it down to one thing, um, words matter. And it, it, this has been a theme in my life for the past six to eight weeks. A, fr a friend of mine who is also a mentee uh, said something very profound to me one day, and it really made me sit in my own crap for a few minutes. <laughs> and it Figuratively. <laughs> no, yeah, <that's> <laughs> um, words matter. The gravity of our words matter. We are in a position of power, however we view that as little or large. Our words matter and the gravity of what we say has weight to it. And being able to understand that our language and the words that we choose affect people different. Everyone is different. 
Think about the profundity of that. Every person is different. And the weight of what you say and how you say it will be perceived differently according to each individual. I think that's a highly important thing to understand because it's not only going to help you now, should you decide to go global, should you decide to work in a different country, should you, doesn't matter where you are, or who you're speaking with, cross-culturally, your words matter. Matter of fact, in other cultures, they may even matter more. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very, very important that we understand the weight of what we say. I think that's that's great words of advice. It is, uh, yeah, it's something as you get older you start to learn that. If you, yeah, you do. You have the perspective. It's like, oh, and I something I have to catch myself sometimes. You know that. Oh, but this is how I would think of it. And you Doesn't know, matter. it's not about you. It's not about me. It's like you know, and my life experiences are very different than your life experience or Laura's and everybody's yeah. life experiences. So they might think of it. In a very different way so yeah words definitely do matter um i think that's great words of advice for anybody in the industry for a long time or just coming into uh or in any job or in any part of their life uh, words definitely uh do matter well on that note speaking of great words because there have been a lot of great pieces of advice that have been given uh during this uh episode uh i can't believe it's uh it's episode 30. um but it's a good year yeah, uh, it's been a pleasure interviewing both of you and getting to know you a little bit uh, better. I hope to see you both in person at, at some point. Um, Teddy Bay coming in for BCB. Not this I year. I wish. Not I this wish year. Not, not this year. Um, um, this well, month is packed. Yeah, yeah. Fair, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, well, then I look forward to seeing whatever the next event is that everybody's in person. But in the meantime, be well, both of you. And uh, yeah, until next time. Until next Thank time. You. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.